Uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 5, as we turn to God's Word. And uh, our message this evening, as we really open our mission with the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, is to look at this great message, which I've called uh, Power to Forgive. And I base it really upon the words of our Saviour in verse 23 and verse 24 of Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 5. So Luke chapter 5 in verse 23 and verse 24, where the Lord says that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power. He hath power, which means authority. Our Lord Jesus Christ has authority, he says, upon earth to forgive sins. I trust that with this text before us, the Lord will speak to our hearts. Let's just bow in prayer very briefly and ask for the Lord to draw near to us. Father, we are thankful this evening for thy presence. We Think of the, the songs that we've heard and we've sung together and they've, they, they so rightly direct us to Jesus Christ who is freely offered in the gospel. His amazing love and that we would turn our eyes unto him and that we would contemplate, Lord, even that manner of love which is shown towards us. And here, Lord, as we think of the revelation of such love that our Lord declares before a needy world that with him, with him there is a power, there is an authority to forgive to be made whole, to be cleansed. Oh Lord, remind us of these great truths this evening. It is our cry just now, Father. It is our prayer earnestly that thou, Lord, would speak with thy most powerful voice. Help me, Lord, to bring the message to thy people. Give us all hearing, hearing ears that we shall hear what the Lord has to say to us and be glorified now, we ask, in the Savior's holy and in his precious name. Amen. Luke begins uh, chapter 5 that we have here in the Bible by, by telling us that the, the multitudes and the crowds of people were pressing in to hear the word of God. Well, we know what that means in terms of what was happening before our eyes. That such was the, the gathering together of people, such was the, the interest and the intrigue that the crowds began to assemble in great numbers that possibly, human speaking, that, that they couldn't be managed, they couldn't be handled. They began to press, they began to push to hear the word of God. I, I, I'm fascinated by this in chapter 5, verse 1, because what it shows me, what it shows me is that the soul and the primary interest in the hearts of these people right now, and remember something, they had witnessed with their eyes many things. They had seen miracles which the Lord Jesus Christ had performed, they had, they'd seen people being cleansed. They'd seen things unfolding before their, their eyes, which they have never seen before in all their lives. But the one thing which dominates their thoughts and their interest and their understanding is that they must hear. They must hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. The people already beginning to understand that while he was one that could meet their temple needs, and he did, that was part of the Savior's earthly ministry. Miracles were a part of that. Yet the real need was the one of the soul. And dear friend, this evening, that remains exactly the same need this evening and in every age. Men and women, as we read of them here, after years of, of spiritual famine, and when you read your Bible and you, you look at the, 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 the decades and the years which unfolded after Malachi to the Gospel of Matthew, you have to recognize something that there was a period of time in which there was great spiritual darkness. A great spiritual need which engulfed the world that was then known. And men and women and young people and boys and girls, they were in the depths of their spiritual famine, but there was slowly beginning to be an awakening. There had been an awakening for a, a number, we might say, of, of time, where John the Baptist comes onto the scene, uh, other things came into the picture, where God was beginning to strive with the hearts of people and remind them, despite whatever religion there was, there was a great need to know Christ. There was a need of the soul. And, and so here were multitudes and, and the great crowds that, well, we would love to see, wouldn't we as Christians and as a church, pressing to do what? To hear. The, the great dilemma that we, we have in our world in this present day is that the, the, the general uh, desire that people have in this world is to see things. We've got to see sensational things. We've got to see things with our eyes where when we note the work of God, the one of the features of the work of God when it begins to strive with men and women is that he prompts them to desire to hear. To hear what Christ has to say. And that's how Luke begins his gospel account in chapter 5. 
Now he carries on into verse 12, and if you've got your Bible there, you'll see this. You've got the cleansing of the leper in verse 12, a, a remarkable and noteworthy miracle. And what this did, it really increased the crowds all the more. Fame and the reputation of our Lord Jesus Christ, it, it began to spread over a wide area. Great numbers began to pour into the streets, into the community. And again, something you should note in this passage, when you look at verse 16, is that our Savior was not one, if we use the expression, who egged on the crowds. They, they came to him, they poured out of their doors, they poured into the streets. His name was spreading aboard, the, the, the works which he'd seen testifies to the words which he spoke. But in all of this time, the Lord Jesus Christ was not there, in a sense, again, I use an expression, lapping up all of the attention and saying, look at me. No, the Bible says he withdrew drew himself to pray. It's quite astonishing. These are the marks, these are the, the tokens which, which remind us of what a, a work and a move of God is all about. I, I took time to think about these things. I think of the Savior's ministry, his miracles, his words, his works, and the reaction within a community and a society. And I'm asking the question, what is happening here? And the answer is quite simple. God is moving. There was no ability to spread the word through the internet. There was no way in which, uh, the, as we have today in our means, that a, a word could be sent through a, a text and a phone or through social media or any of these things. It was by word of mouth. And by most importantly, it was by the spirit of the living God because the Lord was then striving with lives. Now the question I want you to ask is what happens next? What happens when you've got great crowds pressing in to hear the word of God? What happens when multitudes are coming from every direction to hear and see the words and the works of our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it began to draw all sorts of people. Were all of these people followers of Christ? No. Were they all believers of the Savior? No. There were those actually in opposition to Jesus Christ. Luke records the, the presence of Pharisees. You've got that there in the likes of uh, verse 17, it says on a certain day that he was teaching and there were Pharisees, there were, there were doctors of the, of the Mosaic or the Jewish law. Why were they there? Well, you know why they're there, if you know your Bible relatively well, because they're there to try to trap Jesus Christ. They're trying to snare him in his speech. They're trying to find some way in which they could accuse him of being a blasphemer or being something that was in opposition to God himself. So that's why they were there. And it was in this moment, and I want you to see this with your mind's eye this evening, you need to try to draw the picture with your mind, you need to try to enter into what was taking place here in order to understand the import and the power of what Christ would go on to say next about sins and the forgiveness of sins. Because here is a great multitude, and you've got those who are like the lepers, and those who are the outcasts of society, and those that no one wants any, anything to do with in their life. And on the other hand, you've got these religious hypocrites, and rulers, and Pharisees, and doctors of the religious law. They know everything there is to know. They, they, they know all the things. They can tick all the boxes. And in that moment, along with many other things that were taking place, they would hear with their very ears a message which they must understand if they are to know heaven, that Christ alone has the power to forgive sin. And all of this takes place because of the healing of this man who was brought to Jesus Christ with his paralytic condition. And in that moment, the Lord says, as we shall seek to unfold in our message this evening, do you see what I do with this man? With this man who can't walk for himself, who has no physical ability to hold himself up, do you see the power which is mine to heal? Now that's nothing compared to the power and the authority that I have, Jesus Christ says, to forgive. That's why I say that as we begin our mission this evening, one of the greatest messages we can possibly explore and begin with is this one, the authority and the power that our Savior has to forgive. And as I finish, I leave two thoughts with you. Beloved, notice this, that the Lord Jesus Christ declares his power to forgive. That's a very simple thing, isn't it? But we want to unfold this and see what I mean by it. He declares his power to forgive. Many people will say many things, but are they right? Are they true? Can they back it up? No, he declares it. And then as we shall see in our last thought, he demonstrates it. 
and made a declaration of the power to forgive your sin and the demonstration sink into your heart this evening so that you leave with a certain knowledge that it is well with your soul. So first of all, he declares his power to forgive. Now I want you to see that in the heart of this, this stir that was, was taking place within the community here uh, with our Savior was this message of supreme authority. In many respects, this is what really caused the commotion and the stir in the hearts of these religious Pharisees and rulers. Now, of course, the, the physical healing of a leper and the physical healing of that man that was sick of the palsy or had a paralytic condition, well, that, that's going to cause some degree of stir, isn't it, within a community. If we, if we would see something like that, it would be spread abroad quite, quite quickly in, in terms of news. But the thing that really gripped the hearts of men and women and began something of the talk of the town and of the community is what the Lord Jesus Christ had to say, which he says there in verse 24 as he encapsulates this teaching, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. You know, it's often remarked, and maybe you've said this yourself, that our world is in disarray. It is. It's in disarray, isn't it? We all can see it all around us. But here is the news flash this evening. It has always been in disarray. It always has been. And that's not me trying to make some sort of political or prophetical commentary on how things will get worse or so on. That's just simply stating the facts and the lens and, the, uh, and in the, the, the view of Holy Scripture that the moment, the moment sin entered this world, what did it create? Disarray, chaos, disorder, sin, all manner of things. We are not unique in that sense. It may look worse to us, it may seem to be, it may actually be worse in some respects. Uh, but the reality is that we've always been in a society where we have seen disarray and trouble and need and problems. In, in terms of Luke chapter 5, it had a physical appearance. People that were, were, were with leprosy, people who couldn't walk, the poverty that was there, the, the political needs that were there, all of these things. But you fast forward to our present day, we might dress differently, we might have technology, which is advanced somewhat, but the, the real problem is this, you strip all of these things away, and the Lord says it's still the same problem, we're still in the guilt and the sorrow of our sin, we still need forgiveness. That's why the Lord hones in, and he focuses upon this very message. For us, we identify our troubles, what, financially, materially, and I'm not denying that. And for some people, there are great strains and stresses, and maybe that's what you're going through this evening. Maybe for a long time now. Or health-wise, and medically, and socially, we look around and we see a deplorable world in which we live, and you, you look at your own life and you say to me, you don't really understand all the things which I'm going through and all the sorrows and troubles which I'm having to experience. I certainly don't understand your personal need, but I recognize this, it has always been the case. Men and women will feel these things. Men and women will understand these things. Men and women will complain of these things. They will confess these things, but all the time never recognize the one thing which is needful, that is, before a holy and a righteous and a just God, that we are as an unclean thing, the Bible says. That we are guilty before his holy being. For the greatest degree of disarray and the greatest demonstration of chaos and ruin and need in this world is always the need of the soul. It is our guilt. It is our sin. It is what the Bible calls our condemnation. These are serious things. Pressing things. And, and, and they've been pushed to one side. That's what sin does. It not only drags us down to the dirt of the earth, but it blinds our eyes to see what is our real need. And you understand that when the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, by its very necessity, it has to do the hard work first. It has to bring people to see, this is why you are what you are. And when the man would, would, would put me in a sense, by way of example, illustration, there's this individual who was paralytic, who, who couldn't walk, and, and say, look what I can do. Do you see his need before I gave him power to walk? That's the same thing as the soul. Naturally, you can't love me, you don't want me, you don't desire me, because there is guilt, there is sin, there is need. 
It's a great scene which is set before us. Irrespective of the positive spin that society puts upon itself, uh, this heavy feeling is undeniable. What is not admitted is this need of Christ and guilt, and that's what we have to deal with this evening. You see, my friend, nothing could be as harrowing, nothing could be as awful, nothing could be as dreadful as a life without God's pardon. Nothing is so terrible as to die without the forgiveness of God. And at the same time, we can say by way of contrast, nothing is so blessed, nothing is so happy, nothing is so pure, nothing is so good as the soul that can say, it is well with my soul. What is it the psalmist says in Psalm 32 verse 1? He says blessed. Do you know what that word means? Most of us do. It's It's happiness. It's happinesses. Blessed is he whose what sin or transgression is what? Forgiven. Forgiven. But I thought happiness is found in things that I get. No. But I thought happiness is found in places I can discover and go to. And I thought it was in my family and in my work. Well, there are degrees of joy in all of those things. But spiritual, deep-seated blessedness and happiness is for you to know in this life, not hope, not hope, not think maybe, not wonder if this could be the case. The Bible spells out a certain knowledge that forgiveness with God can be known and should be rejoiced in. And that's what the, the Lord Jesus said to the crowds, that ye may know, not hope to have, but know. So what have brought about these words from our Lord Jesus Christ? Why, why did he turn to the people and say, but, the, but that ye may know? Well, well, that brings us to this declaration. I remember this evening, the declaration of Christ was made to a man and his friends. It's a lovely picture that you've got here in Luke chapter 5. Most of us have read it many times. If we read our Bibles and we come to church, you've got it there in verse 18. These, these men, they bring this man who's bedbound. Uh, and I, I think it's worth remembering that when you think about this occasion and you, and you simply say, well, here are men who bring a man to Jesus Christ. Well, that's simple enough. We can all do that. But that's not, the, that's not what the case is. The man couldn't walk. He, he, he was paralyzed in some form. When you read the word palsy in the Bible or the reference to a paralytic condition, it, it, it's, it's a very general word. It can refer to great degrees of paralysis. So what you've got to do, you've got to look at this man and, and think about what his problem was when he had to be carried. So if he's being carried, it's because his legs are of no use. Maybe his arms were of use, I don't know, but his legs were of no use. What an awful condition to be in. And then we have to remember the, the setting of the Bible times in which we have. Remember that the homes in these regions, they're not like our homes. Again, it's this story in the Bible, but it's so familiar to us. These men, they, they get to the roof. How, how do they get to the roof? They're carrying this man. They, they let him down. How do they do this? Because sometimes, certainly if we're younger, if we, if we have children, you, you think of homes that we have. It, it's maybe the triangular roof. It's got you know, sort of an awkward access to it. But that's not what you have here. In these days, we, we have houses, generally speaking, which were made with flat roofs. There was a stair a way that was allowing access on the outside. And, and so now the picture starts to make sense. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of multitudes of people, that, and these men come with their friend, and they've got no way in through the doors. They can't come through the front doors. They can't come through the side doors. And the crowds are really just pushing them all out, and no one seems to see, no one seems to see them. No one seems to be letting them in. Now here's the question, what to do in that situation? You give up and you go home. And you think, I'll come again tomorrow. We'll, we'll try another way. No, we need to get our friend to Christ. So now they make their way up uh, on the outside of the building. The, the stairs, they give access to the roof. They take off some of the tiling that was on the roof. They, they have rope with them. They've got rope from somewhere. I don't know where, but they've got their rope. And they're, they're lowering. They're lowering their friend to the feet of Christ. You know, when I read those words... How can I read those words and not understand the intensity of the burden and the desire these men had for their friend to bring them to Christ? And then I ask the question, what do I do? 
You see, when we begin with our mission this evening, the, 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 the common mistake is that we think only of unsaved people. My friend, if you're professing to be a Christian, it begins in our hearts right now. Right with me in this pulpit, right with you as a professing Christian, 20, 30, 40, what, 50 years saved, and here are men, and they bring, by every means they possibly can, their friend to know Christ. So you say, what rope can I have? You've got the rope of prayer. You've got the rope of evangelism. You've got rope of literature. You've got rope of personal testimony. You've got the rope of encouragement. You can do these things. Oh, that we would see the example here and understand the burden which lay upon the hearts of these men, the faith which they demonstrated. I believe also, personally speaking, it demonstrates the faith of the man who couldn't walk. Because the Lord Jesus goes on to say, thy faith hath made thee whole. And here was a man that longed to go. He wasn't taken against his will, was he? He didn't rock up to his house and say, you know what, we're going to take you. I don't want to go. Too, too bad. No, that he, he wants to go. He wants to be there. And if he could run and move his legs, he would go there. But he can't. Would you carry me? Will you take me? You, you, you look at these things, beloved, and ask the question, what is the burden I have for souls of men and women? And I'll ask that question to my heart before I'll ask it to you. Do you see then what the Lord says in verse 20? When he saw their faith, he said unto him. Think about that. He saw their faith, but he said to him. He saw what they did, but he said to the individual. Man, or the other gospel account, I believe Mark says, Son, thy sins are forgiven thee. It is clear that the faith seen in the actions of these men was also there in the heart of the one unable to walk. And to this soul, our Lord declared what was far more important than physical strength. Now again, when I think of these words, my initial reaction is this. Here is a man who has an extreme physical need, okay? And I'm sure that he's well aware of it. And he must have felt the pain of it. And he must have felt so different from everyone else in society. And he probably felt so bad, I can't carry myself. Almost a stigma to some degree. And, and the very first thing that Jesus Christ says to this man in his desperate physical need is this. Not you're healed, but your sins are forgiven. And we say, is that not harsh? Are you not shaming this man? Are, are, are you not looking down upon an individual who can't walk for himself and making him feel sort of so bad about his condition? No, this is the Son of God, remember, dealing with what will always be the heart of the matter. The Lord is going to touch him physically, but the great need is the soul. You know what? He could go on living the rest of his life without the power to walk. He could not go into eternity without the power to know sins forgiven. The greater mercy is not the healing of the body, but the forgiveness of the soul. And my friend, that's what we all need before anything else. And so his declaration was to a man and his friends. But at the same time, as so often is the case in the ministry of our Lord Jesus, the declaration was to a multitude and their accusations. We also know that Jesus Christ went on to speak to those that were present. People whose awareness of their own sinfulness before God was not there. They looked religious. They were dressed religiously. They had all of the accolades of men. They were doctors of the law. We know all of the things that there is to know. We don't need to be forgiven. We're fine as we are. God will accept us. How foolish they were. Oh, they began to reason in verse 21. And, and, and can you see their reasoning? They're arguing in their thoughts. It's quiet reasoning. They're not saying it out loud, as we shall see. Who is this which speaketh, they said? Blasphemous. Do you know what they were thinking? They were thinking this. And they were tying in what was theologically correct, but applying it wrong. Who can forgive sins but God only? Well, that, that's, a, that's a tremendous statement, in a sense. Only God can forgive sins, okay? I have no problem with that. But what they did is misunderstand and, and, and forget the fact that there must be a mediator. There is one who, who God appoints by whom we can get to God. But the one that brings us to God, the one that 
is there to cross that great gulf that exists between ourselves and God. He's the only mediator, that is Jesus Christ, which is always spelled out in Old Testament scriptures. Even Job understood it way back then. But they, they, they look at the, the, the Savior, and not for us, that can't be him. And so they conclude he's just blaspheming. He's, he's taking an authority to himself that doesn't belong to him. That's what they were saying. So I want you to see something this evening. Verse 22, Jesus perceived their thoughts. Well, we would say to this, Jesus knew what they were saying. It wasn't said out loud. They didn't have at this stage the audacity or the brashness just to say it out loud in front of the crowds, but it was in their hearts. They were inwardly scorning him. They gave this appearance, possibly of interest. Oh, we've come to hear what you have to say. But in their heart, in their heart, rejection, rejection, hatred, despising. We don't want you. We don't want you. But, but they give this polite appearance that they're listening. Their reasoning was so far away from God. And my friend, I, I remind you this evening that when we think of this great challenge which the Lord brings to them, he brings to it on the basis that he knows their hearts and he knows what their need is. And as we sit here and we hear this gospel and we hear this message being preached, we must remind ourselves that the Lord knows what the obstacles are. He knows what your reasoning is. He knows what your arguments will be. He knows how you're going to counter what the gospel is. He knows that it might be, but I can't do this and I can't be saved and I've lived a a life too far from God. He He knows it all because he knows you all. He knows you through and through. He knows all your reasoning, all your arguments, all of your objections, and he answers every single one of them within this one statement of great truth. I have power on earth and in heaven, might even say, to forgive your sin. This is what he's saying. Christ declares his power to forgive. But as I finish, beloved, Christ demonstrates his power to forgive. Before going on to heal this man who was paralyzed, our Lord then begins to argue or reason and contend back. And why would the Lord do this? You've got it in verse 23, by the way. Notice the way in which the Lord approaches the subject. He says, you know, which of the two or whether it is easier. What is the easier one to say? If I, if I paraphrase this for us this evening, which of these two is the easiest one to do? Your sins are forgiven, or rise up and walk? It's a powerful question. It's a very profound question. It's a, it's a searching one. Now, the design behind the question of our Lord Jesus is very simple. He wants you to know. Okay? He wants you to know this evening. Christianity is about knowing God through Christ. Christianity is is not about feelings, it's not about guesswork, it's about sweet, blessed knowledge which is rooted in God's holy word, that we might know him, Paul says, and the power of his resurrection, that we might know the forgiveness of our sins. And, And in order for the Lord to demonstrate this and to impress saving knowledge on the hearts and souls of men and women who stood and listened to him. He asked them the question. And he says, which is easier of the two? Now what did he mean by this? He meant that no mere man could give the authority or have the power to do either of these things. Okay, that's what he means. No mere mortal, sinful son of Adam can do any of these things. He cannot heal by his own power, and he certainly can't forgive sins by his own power. And then we say, ah, but didn't the apostles uh, do great miracles in their day and age? Well, they did. And didn't the prophets? Yes, they did. But they did not do it in their own name. They did not do it by their own authority. They did it by the very power and the authority of the Son of God. It is only of Jesus Christ who has inherent power to heal the physical body and greater still, save the needy soul by forgiveness of sins. And so the Lord now reasons and he says this. Which of the two is easier? To say to this man, rise up and walk or to say, 
Your sins are forgiven. And then he says, as he's already said, forgiveness of sins to this man, rise up and walk. And do you know what the Savior is doing there? He's giving them an object lesson. And he says, do you see it? By my word, I raised that man. By my word, I've given strength to weak legs. By my own authority and power, it was nothing of him, and it was nothing of you, and it's nothing of anyone else, but it's all of me. I gave him power to stand and power to walk, that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth. To forgive sin. That's what he demonstrates. It's an astonishing reminder to us. My dear friend, this evening we need not concern ourselves about worrying about the healing of the body today. We'll have ailments, we'll have uh, creaking bones, we'll have injuries, we'll have illnesses, we'll have sicknesses, and we'll look at these things just very shortly as I finish. But the great need is one of forgiveness. It always has been. From Adam onwards, it always will be. You can do with many things you cannot do without the forgiveness of your sins. To be made right with God. I close with these few thoughts. All sickness and suffering is traced to the presence of sin. From the Lord's first address, it's very simple. He says, thy sins be forgiven me. We are experts in pointing at everyone else, aren't we? Don't talk to me about my sins because that's judgmental. When there are multitudes of people that are far worse than me, the Lord isn't concerned with you being concerned about others. God is concerned with you. And he says, your sins need forgiven. Thy sins, they're yours. You've committed them. You're guilty of them, as I am. We're born in our sin, a a natural sinful condition where there is an outworking of it. And a world that is fascinated and fixated with, with all of the calamities which are happening around the suffering and illness and sickness and devastation. Now please bear in mind, I, I'm not saying, I never have said, I never will say, that individual examples of suffering can be traced to an individual sin in a person's life. I'm not going to say that this evening, but I will say this, that all suffering and sickness and sin is traced to the very entrance and the presence of of sin in this world. All grief, all sorrow, all us, all of it is traced to this fundamental reality that we have all sinned and come short of God's glory. However, the word of Christ's authority will then be your eternal comfort. It was the word of Jesus alone which was enough. When he said to the man in verse 24, Arise. It was just like when he said to Lazarus, come forth. But in the word of God and in the word of Christ, there is life to your soul. So here's the thought. He says to the body, arise. And he arose, he demonstrated it. So he says to the man, or he had said to him, you're forgiven. And therefore, it wasn't something to be waited for. It wasn't something to be hoped for. The authority to forgive was in that word. They're forgiven. In that moment, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Do not look for peace or confidence in your feelings, okay? Get away from wishing to feel saved. Of course, many a soul will testify when they've come to Christ, the burden is lifted. And there is a sense of gladness. And that changes from degree to degree with individuals and I guess whatever life they've lived to that point. But the feelings will soon move. And the feelings will soon go. And if you rest your heaven and your hope for eternity on simply a feeling, you'll never know assurance. But you rest it upon this, upon the word that never lies. And upon the truth of God that never changes. And he said, but how do I know and how can I know this for myself? Because there's the cross of Jesus Christ, the finished, finished work. An empty tomb, 
a risen Savior, a living book, in which God says, because, because he's died, because he's risen, because he's the only Savior of the soul, you now can be forgiven right now. And my friend, forgiveness with God is instantaneous. I, I love all of the examples in the Bible where individuals were either healed or given sight or they could hear or even the dead were raised and it's just in the moment. There are aspects of the Christian life and if you are to be saved and you go on, there are aspects where it's a continual thing, okay? But, but coming to Christ, knowing forgiveness is in the moment, and why? Because without the pardon of God in the moment, there's no reconciliation. And with no reconciliation, there is no preparation for death. I've, I've lost count of the times when I've spoken to people, whether it's in a street situation, whether it's just trying to share the gospel, and beginning the question with a very simple challenge. If you die in this moment, where will you be? Now, there's no religion of the, of the sun that will give you an answer, I know where I'll be. And atheism doesn't give you that answer. And the agnostic won't give you that answer. And those that give themselves another name by any other thing will never give you an answer. But the gospel of the Jesus Christ says very simply and most powerfully that even if you're gasping for your last breath, you can know in that moment forgiveness. If the soul rests on Christ alone, why? Because it's his work that is all sufficient, not yours. Not yours. And in the moment he rose up, he took his bed. And it's good, isn't it? He takes his bed, he goes to his house, he's not half, a, sort of half restored, he's fully restored. He's picking up this mattress thing, he's going back to his home. And, and what is it? He's glorifying God. And in verse 26, Luke finishes by saying, they were all amazed and they glorified God and they're filled with fear. And they said, we have seen, we've seen strange things today. Do you know what they mean when they say strange? They don't mean what we probably mean. is something's a bit weird or odd. Things that we never expected. Things that we can't reconcile with our, our reasoning. I don't know how the mission, if I use the word carefully, will pan out these next couple of weeks. But, the, but I was almost inclined just to preach the message on that very last text. We have seen strange things today. Because my prayer is that God will do something that we have not looked for. And he would even begin with our hearts. That even for the Christian this evening, he might just renew our love for him. Understand what it, what it meant for him to bear away our sin. You say you're forgiven, but what does it mean? It means that his life was given. The blood is shed. That's what forgiveness means. My friend, if you, if you don't know his forgiveness, even as you sit where you are, you can cry like a needy soul, forgive me, save me, and you will have the knowledge thy sins are forgiven. Let's pray. Oh Lord, this evening pass us by mercifully. And speak to every waiting heart and show us, Father, the wonder of it all. And even this evening, we think of maybe some that might listen, maybe here in the church, maybe some online. And as the evenings begin to uh, run into each other, Lord, draw in the souls. Draw in the, the souls of, of uh, needy souls. Bring them to, the, to Jesus Christ, we pray. Lord, even if there's one this evening, as they sit to hear thy word, Lord, give them thy the faith and just in this quiet moment to say, save my soul. There's forgiveness for me. Blessed be that fountain of blood. Oh, wash me and I shall be whiter than the snow. Lord, in these quiet moments, speak on, we pray. Pardon us now with thy great blessing. We ask in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen.